Hi, Life Group leaders. Uh, as you can tell, I am not in my office. I'm in the homeschool area of my house. Uh, I need to be home this week during the time I normally film this because we've got the flu running around in my house, and so it's kind of all hands on deck. Uh, today, we've got the challenge of learning the story of Mark chapter 2, and when we talk about the goal of Life Groups is to provide community, and, and the way that we do that is to help people belong, help people believe, and help people become, uh, this story hits all three of them. There's so many different directions that you could take. There's so many valuable lessons from the text, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Mark, as we learned last week, is a very action-oriented gospel. He leaves a lot of details out and he cuts right to the chase. One of one of my teachers said that Mark is the action movie of the gospel. As we jump in today, I want to do a quick overview of the parts of Mark that we've moved over uh, to get to our text today. Jesus called his disciples in, in early on in Mark and then we have demonstrations of his authority in the Capernaum and the town of Capernaum. In Capernaum, Jesus uh, taught and healed in the synagogues. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, and he healed many others. And then the chapter ends with Jesus' ministry throughout the Galilee area. He made several preaching tours throughout Galilee, and Mark summarizes the first of these. And then related a significant event of Jesus healing a man with leprosy. And that brings us to our story today. Because our story today is the first of five instances that Mark uh, records where Jesus came in conflict with Israel's leaders and how they opposed him. These are all kind of grouped together, so I think the readers could see the opposition from leadership, particularly religious leadership, that that opposition was something that Jesus had to deal with in his in his earthly ministry. So today is the first of that opposition in Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Among all the miracles of Jesus, this is one of the better known ones, uh, the healing of a paralytic. The story is also found in Matthew chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 5. And in typical fashion, Matthew and Luke provide additional details to the story than Mark didn't think were essential. The paralyzed man was let down through the roof by his friends to be healed by Jesus. And the result of the story leads to two outcomes. The first is that Jesus is charged with blasphemy by some. And the second is that God is glorified by the other, other people who are present who were amazed by what just happened. So the story takes place in Capernaum, which... Matthew describes as Jesus' own town in Matthew chapter 9. It was his base uh, for his ministry in the Galilee area. It's on the northwestern uh, part of the lake. We start our story with Jesus preaching in a house, which is soon overflowed with listeners. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after one of his preaching tours, it didn't take news of his arrival long to circulate, and soon locals were mobbing him. Jesus couldn't find a restful retreat even at home. And so he graciously used the opportunity to preach to them. I think what we can glean from this is that Mark is stressing that Jesus was popular at this time. People wanted to hear from him. They were excited to be around him. Which brings us to the next part of the story, verses 3 and 4, is of the paralytic. His friends carry him to Jesus. The man is completely immobile in a time before wheelchairs, and so he's confined to a stretcher or a pallet or a bed, however you want to call it, and he's unable to enter the house because there's so many people packed in the house. Now, the first thing we have to consider is, was this man's paralysis due to his own sin? Mark doesn't make that connection, so I don't think we should either. But we do know that sickness in all of its forms is a reality in our world because of sin, because of the fall. And I think we can see that from Genesis and from Romans 8. But in order to truly deal with physical brokenness, Jesus had to do something about sin. And the point of declaring the man's sins as forgiven was to show Jesus' authority to establish God's kingdom on the earth. What we know that they didn't know at the time is that Jesus is making all things new. So with great effort, his four friends let him down through the roof. 
And in order to understand what's happening, it's helpful to visualize the layout of a typical uh, ancient Near East home. And this is for like peasants, this is a small one room structure built out of mud brick and it has a flat roof. You, you can see the picture that I've shown here. Uh, access to the roof, which was used as an additional living space, was typically made by an outside staircase. The roof itself was made out of reeds or wooden beams covered with thatch and compacted earth to make it waterproof. So just try to imagine the energy and the drive of these four men to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus so that he could be healed. They obviously weren't concerned about the damage that they were doing to the house, not to mention the dust and the debris shower that they gave everybody inside the house listening to Jesus. The Jesus observes the faith of the paralytic and his four friends, and he pardons his sins. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. It seems strange, it might seem strange to us that Jesus forgave him first, but we'll see why as the story unfolds. The scribes, the religious teachers, of the day or observe this story and are thinking uh, thoughts of Jesus committing blasphemy. Silently, Mark tells us, they think, who can forgive sins but God alone? And then verse 8 starts with immediately. There's that word from Mark again. Immediately, Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he says, which is easier to say, and implied, which is easier to do, to forgive or to heal? Because both require divine authority and power, but Jesus has the power to do both. And so here is Jesus' purpose in forgiving before healing. Jesus chose to do the one that they considered harder to show that he could also do the one that they considered easier. He did the miracle, which they could see, that they might know that he had done the other one that he could not see. Jesus made known his divine power to forgive sins, to reveal that he's not some charismatic speaker or teacher. He is God. So then we have a happy ending in verse 11 and 12. The paralytic's healed. Jesus commands him to arise, which he couldn't do moments ago, to take his bed or his stretcher and to go home, which he does immediately in the presence of everyone. And the people were amazed. They had never seen anything like this before. A couple of things from the other Gospels. Matthew adds that their amazement was that God had given such power to a man. And Luke adds that their amazement was joined with fear and that they were also glorifying God because of what they saw. So our story ends with this. A man's healed, the people are amazed, Jesus' power was made known, but most of all, God is glorified. And if you notice, and I think it's telling of human nature, that Jesus is not glorified. Most of them marveled at the physical miracle they even glorified God, according to Luke, but they didn't worship Jesus as God because they still didn't see the point of the story, that Jesus is God. Here's a great quote from Charles Ryrie. The main purpose of the miracles was to teach and to reveal. Christ used miracles to demonstrate his deity, to support his claims of being the Messiah, to serve as, an, as illustrations of deeper spiritual truths. But the miracles also remind us of the consequences of sin, sickness, blindness, death, and the power of the Lord to do something about those consequences. That's why many of his physical cures illustrated so well the spiritual salvation he secured when he died and rose from the dead. Well, amen. Kind of a walk through the text of this week uh, with, with your leadership guide and the, and the guide in the back of our discussion guide. You obviously can take the discussion in different directions, and that's completely fine. You know, your goal as a leader and a guide is to read the text, to get to know your class, to understand who they are and their needs. And then as you prepare to ask God, God, what is the one thing that my class needs to hear from this text? So you might not even really address the issue of Jesus' divinity. You may might admire the bravery and passion of the four friends. They were deeply concerned about their paralytic friend and they wanted him helped. They had the faith that Jesus would and could meet his need. And they didn't just pray about it. They went to work and they didn't let difficulties discourage them. And Jesus rewarded their efforts. I mean, Warren Wearsby asked how easy it would be for them to say, well, there's no sense in trying to get to Jesus today. Maybe we can come back tomorrow. That's not the approach that they took. They did what they had to do to get their friend uh, to be healed.
And so maybe the application to your class is to challenge them to be men and women with that kind of faith, to bring the unsaved to the gospel. There are people paralyzed by sin in many, many ways. Most, if not all of them, will never know the gospel unless someone drags them to it. So maybe your class just needs to be challenged in that direction. I had a couple of questions for you this week that you might want to ask your class. I think the ones in our discussion guide are really sharp, but just in, along those veins of what do we do in, in life groups, we belong, we believe and become. Our belong question this week is, do you have any friends or neighbors or coworkers with pressing needs? How will you help them or encourage them? The belief part is ask your class, how would they answer the question that Jesus asked in verse 9? Is it easier to heal or is it easier to forgive sins? See what they would say. In what way does the healing that he did address the doubts in the minds of the religious leaders? Who is this man who says he can forgive sins? What does the healing do to address their thoughts? And then finally, the become question is, people are aware of their physical needs, but maybe not the needs uh, for their sins to be forgiven. What are practical ways that we as a class this week can help other, to help other people see their need for Christ? And so that's what I've got for this week. I'm praying that you have a great lesson this Sunday, and Godspeed.